Okay, so let's uh, move on. So we'll start uh, this uh, section for two today. Is uh, unfortunately I can't, This is a beautiful set of uh, ideas involved into this, but I cannot be fair to them because we don't have that much time. So I can just give you a, a taste of what it is about. Uh, the same with the next section, which is uh, supergravity. So I will try to cover both today, just uh, for completeness, rather than than than. Uh, give you full details and uh, I will include some things about this in the example sheet so you will have more time to enjoy this uh, extended supersymmetric Lagrangians. So remember that uh, in uh, so far I have said it several times and I can insist is that for n equals to 1 for n equals to 1 the the action depended on the on the essentially on three arbitrary functions and psi, which is a, a parameter. So <coughs> the point uh, is that, uh, as I told you the other day, it was good to have w and f to be holomorphic because uh, the holomorphicity was the argument, uh, the reason why at the end they had a very good quantum properties. For instance, W was not renormalized at any order in perturbation theory. This is probably one of the most important results for n equals to 1 supersymmetry. And F is renormalized only uh, at one loop. And, and after that, it's not renormalized, as I told you. Whereas K, being non-holomorphic, gets corrections to all orders. <coughs> OK. So uh, that's, that's, that's what, what we had so far. And so let's see what happens to n equals to 2. n equals to 2. The important thing we have to notice is that uh, if I, n equals to 1 is called simple supersymmetry, and n equals to 2 and beyond is called extended supersymmetry. But simple supersymmetry is actually the most general in, in global supersymmetry. So all the other cases are particular cases of n equals to 1. So you have seen already the most general case. Okay, So that's good. Of course, more general than n equals to 1 is n equals to 0. Of course. <laughs> so, it has no supersymmetry. So they are all particular cases. The more supersymmetry you have, the more constraints the Lagrangian are. So for n equals to 2, you can see that at the end, the Lagrangian will be, can be written in terms of these uh, arbitrary functions, uh, except that they will be more constrained. They will be further constrained. So let me take, for simplicity, just the, the case of a vector. The, the vector superfield for n equals to 2. And, and the vector, uh, the, uh, it will include, you can write it, uh, let me see if I, yes, the, remember that for the vector multiple, we wrote it like this lambda, a mu, psi, and phi. And uh, this one was an n equals to 1 vector so it will come from an n equals to 1 vector superfield that we call it v and this one is an n equals to 1 chiral that I will call phi okay so <coughs> on vector superfields can be written in terms of couplings of a uh, chiral and, and, uh, and a vector if they all come together in one single n equals to 2 multiplet. It so happens that uh, that this particular case is, is, is the simplest, is that you can write the n equals to 2 action in terms of, uh, of, uh, of the n equals to 1 superfields. And the, so the n equals to 2 action is, uh, is very simple. So, so the action will be very simple. Why? The reason is that you have to put together a, a 2 n equals to 1 
multiples in one single n equals to two. And for that, there will be what is called a, a remember the, the R symmetry that we talked about. So there will be an, a group containing SU2 and SU2 R symmetry that uh, will relate the two supersymmetries that uh, will, this will satisfy. And this put constraints on what kind of, uh, of, of uh, things you can have. And in the action, that, that implies that the action will be such that it's zero. So no superpotential. So in the sense, we will have free thing and superpotential as a function of this capital phi, but that's, that is zero. But and the rest, k and f, can be written in terms of a single holomorphic function. That uh, is, I call, um, f, but in a sophisticated way, f of phi. And this function is called the prepotential. Okay. So this is, is good. This is good news because remember that in n equals to one, we had no information about k. Uh, in quantum corrections, because k was not holomorphic. But now k will be derived from a holomorphic function, which is uh, f. In particular, I can tell you f of phi will be the second derivative of f with respect to phi, and k of uh, phi and phi dagger <coughs> is uh, 1 over 2i phi dagger to, to v gf by d phi. Minus complex conjugate. Okay. So, so that means that just giving just this arbitrary function f, we find the full uh, Lagrangian. So the full Lagrangian only depends on one single function, and this function is chiral. Being chiral, then it will get it, all the all the good perturbative corrections, all the good all the good properties on the perturbative corrections of the Lagrangian. For instance, we know that little f is not corrected beyond one loop. So we already know that this will not be corrected beyond one loop. So then that means that we have the full Lagrangian only at one loop, which is very good. OK, so full perturbative, of course. Just one loop. And actually, people have computed that. Uh, first of all, well, phi f equals to phi square at three level. And then they computed the one loop. And this is actually phi square log of phi square divided by lambda square, where lambda will be the, the cutoff corresponding scale where you're, you're uh, doing your calculation in the way that uh, I mentioned before in the, in the sense of those Wilsonian actions. And uh, so that means that people have computed that once, and that's it. So this whole function is phi square log of phi square or lambda square. And from here, you can read now little f capital K. And from them, you can plug it into the general equation expression for your Lagrangian, and then you have a full Lagrangian. 
Okay, you have all gauge couplings, everything. Kinetic tensor scalars, everything. So this is extremely powerful. So this is so you, you can see how, how supersymmetry is so constrained that eventually just a one loop calculation gives you the full Lagrangian to all orders in perturbation theory. So, <coughs> so th this is uh, one of the beautiful things about uh, extended supersymmetry that is very restrictive. Uh, and uh, so, but of course, all this is only perturbative. So perturbative, we have the whole control on the on the on the action, but that means that uh, in principle we can have non-perturbative corrections. So at the end, so okay, so okay, so but uh, but uh, let me see, f total will then be e f one loop plus an f non perturbative okay so the f one loop is known and the only thing that is left to be known is f non perturbative so knowing that we get to know this essentially we have control of the full theory we have a a perturbative and non perturbative. So up to the 1990s, this was the only thing that was known. So this result that was known. And in 1994, there was this work of uh, Cyber and Witten, and that's a, considered one of the great uh, uh, progresses in field theory in the last, uh, say, 15, 20 years, is that they were able to, to get a control of this non perturbative part also. Okay. So this is a 1994 cyber witten and <clears throat> so <clears throat> so this is important this is very important so, and and uh, and uh, 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 let, let me just give you some story about the cyber witten so the, the idea is that uh, good luck <laughs> The idea is that uh, <laughs> they have rowing competition too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, so, so let me see. Uh, so so th then the thing is that you know what the difference between perturbative and non-perturbative. You, you, you have heard about what is non-perturbative? Yes. <laughs> well. Um, who doesn't know what non-perturbative is? Let me just. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> okay. Let me. Uh, the, uh, both. <laughs> who, first of all, who, who does not know what non-perturbative means? Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. So, in the sense, perturbative means that is that this will be like a series. Uh, in, in powers of g. So g to the n, say, times the coefficients. So that would give you all the, all the couplings. Okay. Non-perturbative means that something cannot be written like this. So for instance, a series in the form of uh, e to the minus a g squared times coefficients times another coefficients, for instance. Because we know that, that the function e to the minus Sorry, e to the minus a n over g square. Because we know that the function e to the minus one over g square cannot be all the function and all these derivatives vanish at zero. So it doesn't have a good Taylor expansion, but uh, it is there. It's correct. Right? So you, you couldn't get any any of this of the information about this function from just a Taylor expansion around powers of uh, of g. So this is perturbative. This is non-perturbative. Okay. So typical, typically, effects that uh, contribute to this are instantons and, and this kind of thing that you will see in the next term. So these are things that go beyond your Feynman diagram expansion. So all this you can get from Feynman diagrams, and here you don't get it from standard Feynman diagram, diagrams. 
but it's, it's part of your of your of, of your of your of your theory. Your theory, you have effects which are non perturbative like a, a, a tunneling a tunneling effect. You go from one minimum to another minimum. It's it's it's, it's, it's something non perturbative. You're not going around the minimum. You just go from one to the other one, and and these things happen. And uh, yes, for instance, yes. And uh, so, so that means that uh, this, this we have, these are important parts of your theory, and the Feynman diagrams don't give you the full information. So the, to have the full information of, about the theory, you need to know, to know both. And usually, this is the less understood part of, 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 of uh, field theories, and also string theory by itself. So it, is, it was a big development in 1994 that Cyber and Witten were able to essentially control this, this, this series, the, the non-perturbative series here, they were able to find uh, by using some beautiful mathematics. Uh, and uh, in part, is, uh, there is a, a, there's something, probably you have seen the electromagnetic duality in the, in the context that uh, Dirac introduced many years ago, where you exchange electric and magnetic fields and uh, electric charges and magnetic monopoles. So that you start with an SU2 theory here, you have a phase where it will be in the U1, and the U1 will, ha will carry that uh, uh, electromagnetic duality. And because of that, you can find a lot of uh, beautiful mathematical properties that allows you to, to discover this uh, number two effects here. So that is uh, 1994. Unfortunately, I cannot go tell you details about that. If you want to know details, uh, the review of Bilal it's, it's okay. There are many reviews on this cyber witten, but in the context for this course, since Bilal gives a general discussion of of, um, of n equals to one supersymmetry, no, supersymmetry in general, so he will he spends half of his of his uh, lectures just describing this n equals to two. So if someone is curious, that 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 could be a good reference. But there are many other references that review this this work. This work. And in particular, the first paper, at least, of Cyber and Whitten is a beautiful piece of work. So it's 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 nice to 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 to, to read it. Even if you don't understand it, you just see it. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Good. So that is n equals to two. And, but of course, n equals to two not, not only has uh, vector superfields, fields, but it also can have also can have vector plus hyper multiplets. And in general, this can be done because vectors will include the, for instance, if you are in a vector superfield, the corresponding scalar uh, or carrel field has to be in the adjoint because it has to be in the same representation as the uh, as the vector, of, as, as the gauge field. Uh, but if you have hypermultiples, the hypermultiples have only uh, two chiral multiples of n equals to one. So you can have uh, matter in different representations here. And in general, this will be more complicated. Uh, and uh, yes, and, and that's the only thing I will say. <laughs> that in general are more complicated. People have discussed some of this, and, uh, and part of it is understood, but it, of course it's not as well as, as this. There's a second paper of Cyber and Witten where they, they discuss this, and of course many people after that, but in general I, I will not mention it. It's just to let you know it's more complicated. However, there is a particular case where vector and hypermultiplet together uh, give you something very simple, and, very, and this is the case of n equals to four. And for n equals to four, the n equals to four vector, you can write it as a n equals to two vector plus an n equals to two hyper. So let me just call this phi. I will put a phi one psi one because the hyper will have phi 2 psi 3 psi 2 and phi 3. Okay, so this will be an n equals to 2 vector. Plus an n equals to 2 uh, hyper. 
And both together gives you an n equals to 4 vector, in the same way that uh, these are 2 n equals to 1 multiplets together. So all together is n equals to 4 vector multiplet. And for this particular case, this is a very interesting case, because uh, remember I told you that n equals to 4 is the largest supersymmetry we can have before touching gravity, without gravity. So for this one, you can see, well, what is the effective action for this? It's, low, it's more restrictive than n equals to 2. And it's actually, it actually is. And uh, the effective action actually does not depend on any arbitrary functions. There are no, remember that n equals to 1, we had k, w, and f. In n equals to 2, for the vector case, we had only this uh, capital F, which was the, hyper, the prepotential. And for n equals to 4, actually, there are no arbitrary functions. And uh, <clears throat> the only arbitrary thing that you can play with is only a constant parameter, which we call tau. And tau has a real which I call theta, or theta over 2 pi, plus i and then I would call 4 pi over g squared. Okay. This is the term that multiplies. So remember, tau, well, tau is essentially the, 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 tau is replacing the genetic function. In this case, it's just a constant, and it's tau. So this means that uh, real of tau is the thing that multiplies f mu nu of mu nu in the Lagrangian. And imaginary of tau, oh, I'm sorry, the other way around. Uh, real of tau multiplies f mu nu of mu nu dual. And imaginary of tau is the thing that multiplies f mu nu of mu nu. So that means that this 4 pi over g squared is the thing that multiplies the, is, is, is the gauge coupling, essentially. It multiplies f mu f mu. And theta is the coefficient of FF dual. FF dual, remember, I told you it was a topological thing. Theta is usually called the theta angle. That's of, of, it's, it's, it's a, um, because this term is topological, so it's topological. But uh, in supersymmetry, they all come together as a complex uh, quantity, and it's, and it's called tau. And that's the only free thing you have in your whole n equals to 4 theory. So there's no, there are no free functions. So that means that this following n equals to 4 theory is exactly known. Just take n equals to 1 and just put f equals to, to tau, and that's it. Okay. And uh, so, so that, that, that is good. So you can compute, and you can see what the uh, uh, to 4 will have several scalars and so on, you can compute what the, uh, what the scalar potential is and so on. And, uh, and you will see that in, in, in the example sheets, so that they will distribute you, so you can compute what the properties of n equals to 4 are. Uh, so at the moment, the only thing I can tell you is that uh, since I told you already that n equals to 2 has beautiful properties, you expect that n equals to 4 has even more beautiful properties, because it's higher symmetry. And it actually does, because it, since it only depends on this parameter tau, uh, n equals to 4 has uh, uh, several good things. One is that uh, <coughs> the theory is not only renormalizable, but it's, it's finite. Something you can get a, a an idea of this also is, is that uh, I, I understand you have seen already what the beta function is in, uh, in quantum field theory, or in advanced quantum field theory, or in the standard model, in either of the two. Yes? Who doesn't know what a beta function is? OK. 
uh, usually Usually, the, the, the gauge couplings change with energy. That's a typical thing in, in, in field theory. That's one of the general implications of field theory, that the gauge couplings change with energy. And the way that they change with energy is, is, is especially determined by what is called the beta function. So, so you have the equation. Um, So this is tell you how, how the gauge coupling changes with energy. And uh, lambda will tell you the, the energy, how, how it is. And usually, in, in this, uh, beta is, is proportional to, to g cube at one loop for, uh, say, for n equals to 1. And uh, in general, that this this tells you, for instance, for, uh, this, this tells you that the the gauge coupling changes with energy. This is uh, gauge coupling and energy, or lambda. And this is, tells you that at large energy, this is weak, and, and then it becomes strong. This is a standard as asymptotic freedom. Uh, that's a QCD case, and uh, QED is the other way around. QED starts weak and then becomes strong, and then you have the lambda pole at some point. So that, that's how it happens. However, in, B, in, in n equals to 4, beta is just 0. So that means that there is no change of the, of the gauge coupling with energy. So that's the property uh, of n equals to 4. And since beta doesn't change with energy, that means that there is a bigger symmetry in your theory. That is, there is a conformal invariance. For those of you who have seen a string theory, string theory has conformal invariance in two dimensions. This is a conformal field theory in four dimensions. Okay, so so this this theory is is uh, very well behaved very well behaved in, in, in the quantum domain. And furthermore, just to finish, uh, I run out of space, but furthermore, it has this duality that I, uh, I was mentioned for uh, uh, electromagnetic duality is actually present, is fully present in this n equals to four theory. So there is something called what we call S duality, which is uh, essentially taking tau to A tau plus B over C tau plus D, is realized in this uh, theory, where A, B, C, and D are, are integers. And so this, this is a, what is called an SL2 to Z group, and uh, in particular, for particular choices of D of, of the coefficients, for instance, for D equal to zero and A equal to zero, this goes like one over tau. And tau, remember that the imaginary part of tau is the gauge coupling. So if you're changing tau to one over tau, or uh, that you're changing the gauge coupling from weak to strong. So this is symmetry that relates strong coupling. So <clears throat> this is one of the beautiful properties of this uh, theory that you can control the strong coupling, and do I know in the weak coupling, because it's, it's, it's manifestly uh, present in this, uh, in this theory. And uh, so there's a strong to weak coupling duality, or S duality. And, uh, and uh, that has made this theory very, very, very good to, 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 to study, and, uh, and also uh, that source of this uh, so-called ADS-CFT correspondence. Now, you probably you have heard about what ADS-CFT. That's one of the 
proposals of uh, same of Maldazin at, uh, seven years ago or so. And, uh, and that's relating to two theories which are completely different. One is in AD, uh, string theory on ADS space, anti decidual space, in five dimensions, equivalent to a conformal field theory with no gravity in four dimensions. And what is this conformal field theory? It's precisely n equals to 4, which is conformal. So the n equals to 4 is the basis of this equivalence between two completely different theories that people have been uh, working in the last few years. So that, that this is. The key part of, the, of this correspondence is, is n equals to 4. Okay. So, <clears throat> yes, so uh, this is just to give you uh, an idea of how strong supersymmetry can be and how beautiful these things can be. Unfortunately, I cannot have more time to dedicate to this. Uh, as I say, I will, I will include one question about potentials and so on in n equals to 4 to give you a taste of how to, things are, are, uh, uh, are nice in, in, uh, in n equals to 4 or n equals to 2 supersymmetry. But I cannot go beyond that in this course. OK. so. That's nice. So let me just move to the next part, which is supergravity. And again, I cannot be fair to the subject, because it's, it's, uh, it, it will take a whole course by itself to discuss supergravity, because it's, it's very technical. Uh, but the idea is, is very simple. The idea is that, is that uh, we know that, that uh, what is, it, what is it that we know in, uh, in, in um, we know in, in, um, in gauge theories that we set a field phi going to e to the i If alpha goes from constant something interesting happens and that becomes then this becomes a full gauge theory. Okay, so you have to introduce a corresponding gauge field and so on. That's something we know. So so what is it that we are doing? Of, uh, of of the super of, of um, space time dependent in supersymmetry we know the supersymmetry transform oh, call phi yes that let me just call Epsilon is the parameter for symmetry transformation. So the question is, what having epsilon to be not a constant, just to be a space-time dependent quantity? Okay, so <clears throat> I jump a little bit from here, but uh, if we make alpha to alpha to x, we have to introduce a gauge field a mu. In supersymmetry, we have that, but we know we know that supersymmetry is part of uh, the whole Poincaré algebra. Right? It's a space-time symmetry, so we are making. The supersymmetry parameter to be constant, we, ha we, we can make also the parameter of the whole Poincare symmetry to be constant. And what happens when we make Poincare symmetry constant? 
uh, sorry, constant, uh, the, the parameter of Poincaré symmetry, we make it uh, uh, space-time dependent. What will happen? So we make the Poincaré symmetry, we make it local. What will happen? General coordinate General transformation, exactly. So if we make Poincaré symmetry uh, local, we get that we get gravity. Okay. So now the same thing. We make SUSI local by just setting the the, the corresponding parameter to be a space-time dependent function by making this. This is making local. And so then we get supergravity. So that, that's the idea of supergravity. So what, what is it that we have then? If we have the gravity, that means that the gravity is determined by a, a corresponding uh, metric tensor that is also can be written in terms of, of fear binds like that. You have seen fear binds, the, the tetrads? Tetra OK. So you have that for gravity. For supergravity, then you have to introduce a new field. And that what, what has what what can the field be? Has to be is the field that is the partner of of, of, of the graviton. Remember that we had the graviton in when we studied the, the multiples, and the corresponding field is a gravitino. And the gravitino will be an object which is is a fermion, but carries an index. Okay, and this is for n equals to one supersymmetry. Because if you have more supersymmetries, then you do have more gravitinos. Because remember, you start with the spin 2, a helicity 2 object, and you apply the creation operator, and you get n helicity 3 halves objects for, for, for n extended, for n supersymmetry. And for n equals to 1, you get only one. But for any other n, you get as many, as many gravitinos as the number of supersymmetries that you have. So. <coughs> So this is, in some sense, this is, if you can say that, that, that the gravitino is the, is the gauge field of supergravity. You already had the metric for gravity, so the gravitino is the gauge field of supergravity. So that's something to have in mind. So the corresponding gauge field for supergravity is the, is the gravitino. OK, so, so then the, the typical question is to say, well, what, what kind of actions we can write for, for that makes a supersymmetric coupling between gravitinos and, and, and gravitons. And people uh, struggle for a while, because it's a very technical thing. And uh, finally, in 1997, 1977, sorry, there were two groups. One is the, the Friedman, Ferrara, and uh, Van Nieuwenhuizen. And the other group, like a week after, <laughs> Desert and Sumino. And they, they found a supersymmetric way of, of, of extending the, the action of, of uh, supergravity, of, of gravity. <clears throat> so they, they find the supergravity action to be d for x square root of g. <clears throat> the typical Einstein term. But then there is a, a term for the, the, the kinetic term for the gravitino, which is this. Okay, so this is Einstein, Einstein Hilbert. Einstein Hilbert. And this is uh, what is called the Rarita Schwinger. Action for a spin three halves object. And 
dot, 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 dot. So this is, this is where the difficult part was, OK? <laughs> OK. Everybody was expecting to have the standard kinetic term for both fields, and then the rest is. That you get you you get up to four fermion fields, and it's a long calculation, and that's what it took them some time to get it. But for us, at least, it's, it's good to know that that well that that you can write it. But uh, thinking about the phenomenology, the the interesting thing is it's not only how gravity coupled to itself, I mean, gravity and gravitino couples, but how the whole thing. Gravity couples to matter fields in, uh, uh, of say, like gauge bosons and to uh, quarks and leptons and so on. So the question is, you can start with this uh, with uh, supergravity, and then combine with what we have found about the general couplings of uh, cattle and vector superfields, uh, depending on k, w's, and f's, and if we can write a general action coupling that to gravity. So that that will include. Coupling everything, everything we know, just uh, the gravity multiplet to all matters and gauge field multiplets. And that has been done. And it was uh, done actually in full detail by Cremer et al. in 1981. So let me see. So, yes. Supergravity coupled to matter. <clears throat> in n equals to 1. And this is a uh, Cremer et al. in 19, uh, 1981. And the et al. means that there are many authors. And the reason is that it's extremely difficult and technical, so you needed many people to check the calculations. And. Um, and they got a very nice result. And at the end of the day, things look complicated. Uh, and there are several ways to, to, to do this calculation. You can actually, um, they did it more or less by, uh, well, by brute force, something called uh, tensor calculus. And you can do it also in, uh, in, in terms of superfields. And for that, you can see the book of uh, Wes and Bagger. Uh, there's a whole superfield formulation of n equals to 1 supergravity. Which is, um, I personally think it's, it's a little bit cumbersome. So usually the, the techniques used by them or used by the, for the group, they, they use uh, um, superconformal invariance. That may be th that's the nicest and cleanest way to do it. You start with a theory which has an extra symmetry, conformal symmetry, and at the end you break it by setting, imposing that the the Einstein term, the coefficient here is just the, uh, the, the Newton's constant. So just that breaks this, the, the, the conformal symmetry and fixes the rest of the Lagrangian. So that's the easier way to do it. But anyway, all, they are all very technical. So let me just tell you in the next five minutes, what is it that it is that we get? What, what is it that this modifies what we know? OK? So at the end, the Lagrangian, or the action, will be the supergravity action, but plus a supergravity uh, an action depending on k, w, f, and the phi Heliopoulos, properly covariantized uh, with the gravity. That means including with the square root of g's whenever you have uh, uh, in front of the whole thing. And also, whenever you have derivatives, put covariant derivatives yeah, to make it Invariant under 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 gravity, so in that sense, that looks trivial, but it's not trivial. So there are more things that you, you we will we will learn, we, uh, we will learn. So in particular, once you do that, so the Lagrangian idea will be similar to the global supersymmetry because it will depend on the same arbitrary functions. So, so except that the uh, uh, explicit expression is, is is not the same. So <clears throat> so this is similar to global supersymmetry. Except <coughs> there are extra things, so extras. There is an explicit, what is called a color symmetry, color symmetry, that was not manifest in, in the global case. 
And this is a killer symmetry is that you take the killer potential and just change it. So k will be a function of phi and phi dagger plus a function of phi plus a function of phi dagger. Okay, so and at the same time, if you transform, sorry for the notation, I better, I better use, sorry about this, I better use the, the, the phi phi star, because it's, I'm just talking about the first component of the super field. <coughs> sorry about that, I better use the first component of the super field rather than the super field itself, because I'm just talking about the components. And W then goes to e to the H W, the same H. Okay. The important thing is that you're shifting the carrier potential by a holomorphic function, and the, the superpotential you just multiply by e to the H, and then that leaves the whole Lagrangian invariant. In particular, then from here you can see that there is a, the whole Lagrangian depends on one single. On one single combination of, of uh, K and W, which is Kremer et al. call it like a G, which is K minus log W square. Okay. So S depends only on this combination. And if you allow me two more minutes, I finish the supergravity today. So. Another important, another important difference from uh, the standard supersymmetric case is that the <coughs> the F term potential, scalar potential, takes the following form: B F term. Is e to the k times this is the, one of the questions that I have written more often in my life, so I should remember it. <laughs> so e to the k, I should write divided by m Planck square just to to make sure how the, the the m Planck appears, and this will give you k inverse i j star d i w d j star w star minus 3 w squared. And this will come with m Planck to the square. Huh? Where this di w is equal to partial w with respect to the corresponding field. Diw plus Dik times W, okay. and this comes also with a factor of m Planck <coughs> square. Okay, so this is called the Keller covariant derivative in the sense that you have a partial derivative plus plus uh, this term. Uh, <clears throat> and I noticed that two things. One is that when you set m Planck to infinity, this reduces to the standard global supersymmetric case. m Planck to infinity, this will give you e to the 0, which is 1. This uh, covariant derivatives, this term, will uh, be zero, and then you just have a standard derivatives, so you have di, di, w, star, and then the, the k inverse. This is what we had in a standard global supersymmetric case. And, uh, and this disappears. Okay, so you will get the standard, the, that gives the standard n equals to one, 
global. Scalar potential. That's the first, the first thing. And the second, which is very important, is that now this V is not positive. Okay? Because there is a minus 3 here. So, so still the whole thing depends on k and w, but now the dependence on the Lagrangian is different, and in particular the scalar potential is manifestly different. And an important thing is that there is a minus three, so you have a positive term minus another positive term. So now the energy in, in uh, n equals one supersymmetric supergravity is no longer a positive quantity. And this is good or bad, depending on how you see it. Uh, I, will, I will see it as good. Uh, so we will try implications of this result. So in general, the, the message I want to transmit is that at the end, the whole supergravity action is well under control, and now we have a full Lagrangian or action that couples all matter, gauge fields, and gravity together in super, the supersymmetric matter. And we know the explicit expressions for, 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 for the terms depending on, again, on k, w's, and, and f. And, um, okay, so you will see in the example sheets questions referring to this. Okay.